Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension and Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Nick Smith. He is the brand new enologist here at UW-Madison in the Department of Food Science. He was born in Lionel Lakes, Minnesota, and went to the University of Minnesota for his undergraduate uh, on the Minneapolis campus. And then he got a, his enology training at Oregon State University, worked for a couple of years in California, came back to the Twin Cities to get a master's degree in food science on the St. Paul campus, and then in April came to Madison to be, as far as I know, the first dedicated enologist here uh, at UW-Madison. I think it's a great time to be thinking about grapes and wine here in Wisconsin. Please join me in welcoming Nick Smith, Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Good evening. Happy you all could come out tonight and talk about some Wisconsin wine. Uh, occasionally I have a little trouble switching to Wisconsin. For so many years, I said Minnesota, so <laughs> forgive me if I make a little slip up there. Uh, as Tom mentioned, I am the first dedicated enologist here at the University of Wisconsin, uh, part of the brand new fermentation sciences program, which I'll introduce shortly here, uh, kind of a rundown of what we'll talk about tonight. I'll introduce myself a little bit, although Tom did a very good job of that already, as well as the new program and the new project that we have going here at the University of Wisconsin. We'll talk a little bit about Wisconsin grape and wine history, move on to some industry statistics, and then kind of go into discussions of cold climate grapes, what makes them unique, how those uniquenesses impact wine production, and what I study and research and work with the industry on improving. Talking about a bit about quality and what that really means, and then talking about the research that we have going on here at the University of Wisconsin, both what I'm doing, a bit of what the horticulture department is doing, as well as the genetics department here, uh, right above us, actually. So it's a brand new position. I started March 28th, so I've only been here a few months. So it's part of the fermentation prog sciences program. Uh, Dr. Jim Steele is the head of, or the chair of that program. We're getting that started, so it's a part, it's basically the first employee of that program as well. So they're doing a lot of research on beer and wine production up there. What makes this interesting is this position was started by an initiative from the industry itself. It is not a university-based, uh, uh, did not sponsor it initially. So the Wisconsin Vintners Association, along with the Wisconsin Winery Association, the Wisconsin Grape Growers Association, got together, teamed up, and wrote a grant to fund this position. And we got funding for several years to get the position started. Uh, what's fascinating about this, from my perspective, having worked in other states, in history is that the first one on there is an amateur wine association out of Milwaukee. So to have an amateur wine association be one of the biggest supporters and proponents of our program, I think is pretty amazing. And they've been very helpful in getting this all started and organized. So the position itself's main focus is on improving the quality of Wisconsin wine. So my main objectives are to go out, meet with wineries, address quality concerns, do analysis as well as formulate research to help improve the overall quality of Wisconsin wine and grapes. So my background, as Tom t mentioned, is I originally got my undergraduate degree in finance and marketing from the University of Minnesota's Carlson School of Management. Uh, ended up continuing on in food science for a while. Uh, during that time, I spent a year at Oregon State studying food science, finished up that year, and then headed south into California where I started an internship uh, a year ago, uh, 10 years ago, in August of 2015, that's when I kind of got full on into wine. So I worked at a facility that used to be owned by St. Michelle Wine Estates out of Hopland, California. Finished my internship there and got a job. Position at Behringer Vineyards working as a wine chemist, doing lots of lab analysis. Uh, before I actually went out west, I actually did research at the University of Minnesota for the enologist who was there. She informed me that there was a position opening up at the University of Minnesota, applied for that position, and eventually moved back to the University of Minnesota in about 2006. 
to do research wine production there. I was the research winemaker and wine analyst for the breeding program. Uh, briefly between here and University of Minnesota, I did go back and did commercial wine production and cider production at Fort Otter's Winery and Vineyard down in Rochester, Minnesota. And then when this position opened up, I applied and accepted and shortly thereafter moved here. So it was a very quick succession. Uh, before we talk about Wisconsin wine history, uh, we're all here tonight, so I'm assuming most of you are wine consumers. Is that correct? <laughs> all right, so next question is, how many of you actually are avid consumers of Wisconsin wine? Yeah, a very good show of hands, great. <laughs> if you ask those questions in Minnesota, you don't always get the same response. That's good. Uh, they've been growing grapes quite out for quite a long time on some level in Wisconsin for, you know, since 1846 when Augustine started the vineyard not far north of here, what eventually would become Muldersheim. And the first commercial winery in the state started in 1867, so we're going on close to 50 years of having commercial wine production in the state of Wisconsin. Muldersheim started in 1972. They're prominent because they are the largest winery here in Wisconsin. Uh, there's been several viticulture areas that have been named and established in Wisconsin. The viticulture area is an area recognized by the federal government for having very specific wine growing, grape growing characteristics. So it's good for marketing and differentiation of the wineries and grapes growing in those areas. Uh, University of Wisconsin didn't really start getting into grape research probably around 2000, 2005, 2008, when they started establishing vineyards at the agricultural research sites around the state. Uh, one of which is over here in West Madison. And then in 2015, just shortly late, not long ago, that's when I came on board. So that's kind of the history of Wisconsin wine. A little bit of statistics. Currently there are actually about 110 wineries licensed in the state of Wisconsin. So you can see from several years ago, that's quite an increase of over 20 wineries. You know, growing roughly five to 10 wineries every single year. And that has been consistent for the last five or 10 years. Up to probably 700 plus acres of grapes, I would say probably more than that. It's a little hard to get a good estimate since a lot of small growers don't really report how many acres they have. But you can see in the last uh, 13 years, they've more than doubled the size and number of grapes grown here in Wisconsin. The five largest wineries are your Wellersheim, Door 44, Parallel 44, which are the same business, Dancing Your Vineyards, uh, Door Peninsula, and Omaro. A couple of wineries that have kind of gone into the recent Recently, are Dancing Dragonfly and Villa Beletza. I think those will probably move into the top five here pretty soon. And we should be proud about some of our wineries, particularly Wellersheim Winery, since it's one of the largest independently held wineries outside of California, including Oregon and Washington. So it's, I think it's about 13th. They're producing 100,000 cases roughly every year. We'll talk a bit uh, about cool climate grapes. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with these particular varieties. Worked a lot with these varieties when I was at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Marquette had just gotten introduced when I started there, so I'm probably one of the few people who has the most experience actually producing that grape. So cold climate grapes, these hybrids, they're an interspecific cross between either Vitis Labrusca or Vitis riparia and the typical wine grapes of Vitis vinifera. So Vitis vinifera are your Chardonnays, your Merlots and your Cabernets. You know, Vitus riparia is also known as a river grape since that's where it predominantly grows or in rivers. Uh, along the river banks, uh, very small berries, small clusters, dark juice, high acid, very high sugar, herbaceous flavor. And I talk about these characteristics because a lot of this genetics get carried over into our other varieties that we're trying to grow now. So these are the type of things that we have to uh, learn how to handle when we try to make these into wine. On the other side, there is the Labrusca-based varieties, which tend to be a little bit lower in sugar, but they have a very specific flavor profile. Uh, the University of Minnesota has relied a lot on Vitus riparia for its cold climate genetics, uh, whereas Elmer Swenson, who I'll mention again here shortly, since he is a Wisconsin-based uh, grape breeder, used a lot of Labrusca-based. So when we think of hybrids, we think of them kind of a one general camp, but there's a really two sort of separate angles that they can take and the challenges that they present aren't quite all the same. So you can see the or Vitus riparia is growing pretty much native throughout the upper Midwest and Canada and down into even Texas. 
And you can see from this picture maybe just how tiny and scraggly those grape clusters are. So they're kind of hard to deal with, very tiny berries, lots of pigment. Uh, it takes a lot of picking to get any real production out of those. So in terms of breeding uh, and varieties you might see here in the Wisconsin market, uh, Marischal Foch and Leon Mio, or Leon Mio, Leon Mio are things that uh, grow in quite a bit here in the southeastern part of Wisconsin. Wellersheim grows a lot of these. Botham Vineyards grows both of these pretty extensively. And they've been around since 1910, you know, or in the 1910s when uh, a French breeder named Eugene Kuhlman produced those varieties, and they've been very popular ever since. They're kind of the basis for cold climate wine production. And in Minnesota and north and west of here, they don't grow as well as they do here. So other breeders, including the University of Minnesota, have been working on trying to improve on those and create other varieties that are better suited for these climates. The uh, University of Minnesota has been working on grapes uh, for a very long period of time. Uh, started breeding roughly in 1905 and started coming out with their first round of grapes that they released in about 1944. I hided bluebell there since that's one that occasionally you do see wineries producing in the wine. I, I don't know if the other three really even exist anymore. I think they might actually be extinct. So. But the initial emphasis of the program was on table grapes, juice, jelly production. It wasn't until about the 70s or 80s when they actually shift focused and put more energy and effort into actually wine grape production. And their first wine grape was released in 96 called Frontenac, which many of you have been to wineries around the state have probably seen. Uh, they're actually hinting that they'll release a new variety, at least when I was still working there, they hinted at it. I don't know what the current status of that is, but hopefully they'll have that out soon. On top of the university breeders, there's been a lot of private breeders. There's a lot of people with a, an interest in growing these varieties. Uh, so way back even in the 1870s, Louis Swelter created Numerous varieties, but one of his biggest ones was beta, which would have been one of the most popular varieties growing in the upper Midwest prior to uh, Prohibition. And was actually pretty widely grown in both Minnesota and Iowa. David McGregor is a private breeder. He came up with Petita Me, which isn't necessarily very popular here in Wisconsin, but you do find some of it in Minnesota. Uh, and after that, of course, is Tom Plocker, who created Petite Pearl, which is becoming a popular grape grown or a very interested variety here in Wisconsin. It's a relatively new variety, so we don't know a great deal about it. We got some of those grapes uh, from the research center this year, so we'll get some new information on those. And he's planning to read at least a couple of new varieties here this year. Uh, one of the other major universities that does grape breeding is also New York. And I mention them mostly because of varieties like Traminette. You might see those in local wineries they are growing Tremon is not cold hardy enough for Wisconsin, but they do grow in Illinois and Arkansas. So you, do, so you occasionally do see that in the tasting rooms around Wisconsin. I can't uh, talk about Wisconsin grape breeding without mentioning Elmer Swenson, who many consider the godfather of grape breeding, especially among the Wisconsin you know, supporters. Should be noted, though, that he did work for the University of Minnesota for about 10 years. And while he was there, he joint, we, they jointly released uh, two varieties, Edelweiss, which is a common grape variety that is turned into wine, particularly here in Nebraska, as well as Swenson Red. And he created and they, a whole slew of other grape varieties he also uh, produced and released, uh, St. Pepin being a popular one, and Brianna around here, and a few of those other varieties you may see uh, when you're out and about in tasting rooms. So what makes the, what's the general differences between these varieties? Well, one is color. In terms of red grapes, the color intensity and the pigmentation is very intense compared to, say, your average vinifera. Uh, one of the things that they have is also, not besides just pigment in the skins, is also their pigmented pulp. You know, Cabernet and Pinot Noir have a clear pulp, but our varieties actually have a pigmented pulp. So we, when you press these things out, they're actually very dark right from the beginning. And the white grapes, they have a bit of a yellow tint, but they also can brown a bit. So there's a, a high polyphenol oxidase activity. If you ever cut open an apple or a banana, it starts to turn brown. So those enzymes also exist in grapes. And the hybrids seem to have a lot more of those than many of the vinifera. 
One thing you'll definitely notice if you try cold climate wines is that they tend to be a lot more acidic. Quite a bit more than vitis vinifera titratable acidities, you know, 11 grams per liter to 15 to 17 grams per liter. And a majority of that is actually malic acid, where vinifera is typically 50-50, got an even split of tartaric to malic, where some of these varieties, like La Crescent, can be almost 75% malic acid, which is important when we discuss later how we manage the acid in the winery. So it's kind of a general summary of some titratable acidities, just to give you an idea that you know, Frontenac is roughly two to three times more acidic than your average red table wine, sometimes three times as much. So there's some of the challenges that we have to embrace and work with when we're making wines from these varieties. But there are other varieties out there, or there are styles of wine out there that could fit those quite well. So sparkling wines would probably be a good use for some of these varieties. One other inch difference is uh, the amount of tannin in, it, or in the variety, especially red, red grapes. Uh, very little tannins in the finished wine. And it's almost completely opposite, versus, so vinifera have a great deal of tannins and not nearly as much anthocyanin content, where the cold climate varieties have a tremendous amount of anthocyanins, not a lot of tannins. So they're just kind of reversed. A lot of people would like to see more tannins in their varieties, but I kind of prefer the fact that we don't have a lot of tannin, in that if we had high tannin and, and high acid, it'd be a very difficult wine to work with, even more than it already is. Um, acid tends to increase the perception of tannins as well as tannins increasing the perception of acid, so having both of those would be a bit challenging. The sugar content can vary a bit depending on the variety, its parentage, and where it's grown. And one of the challenges I had when I was in Minnesota is that the varieties accumulated a lot of sugar, so it could be a very alcoholic wine or put a lot of stress on the yeast. Don't seem to have that issue down here in Wisconsin, in this part of Wisconsin, as much. But those are some of the issues you can have. Uh, the fact that it is lower brace is helpful for different types and different styles of wines. Uh, so, uh, and some of the other properties just for processing scale, uh, difficulties is some of the Labrusca-based ones have a slip skin. So it's a very difficult pulp, and it will just slip right out of the skin which makes pressing extremely difficult for those varieties. But we're here to talk about uh, embracing cold climate wine. So things that we do well, these varieties are almost all very aromatic, very distinct. Um, you unmistakable aroma profiles for these wines, which I think is great. I think people need to kind of embrace that and promote that a little more. And things we can do with acidic wines of flow tannin and low sugar content is we can make things like sparkling wine. It's a perfect option for our varieties as is, as well as things like rosé. Uh, I mentioned here an uh, up-and-coming style called Petnat, which is a carbonated form of sparkling wine, but not nearly as carbonated. So what they'll do is they'll take wine as it's nearing fermentation and bottle it. And then the residual sugar will ferment out, much like a carbonated bottle car conditioned beer. So it's a low carbonated, dry wine, so, which I hear quite nice. And it's an up and coming trend. I see a lot of it coming out of Europe right now. Dessert wines and ports also work very well with our varieties. Uh, two of the largest and fastest growing markets in the wine segment world are Sauv Blanc, which typically are dry acidic wines, as well as rosés, which things like Marquette and Frontenac can make very nice rosés. And I always say that the Midwest is kind of like the wild west of grape growing. There are no limits. There's nothing telling us what we can and can't do. So hopefully some creativity and adventurous people will come out and create some new things. Uh, so some statistics on uh, both Sauv Blanc and Rosé. You can see that the blended table blush market was up 33% last year. So I think that's a good, pro you know, it's a good opportunity for wineries here to take advantage of that as well as to maybe embrace some of the lesser dry style or lesser sweet styles like Sauv Blanc and New Zealand wines, which tend to be dry and acidic. I should note that uh, even while the blush category is up 33%, Wayne Sinfandel was actually down 7% over the last year. All that is great, but one of the things that you know, I'm here for is to talk about quality. So quality in Wisconsin wine. 
you know, our purpose, my purpose is to help improve the quality of Wisconsin wine, you know, identifying some of the top quality challenges and issues. So last, when I first got here, I surveyed all the wineries in the state to get an idea of the things they thought were their top, or the top quality challenges for the state of Wisconsin. And these are the, these are the issues that they brought up, and they're the typical culprits of almost any wine production area out there. So oxidation, sulfide production, volatile acidity, quality of fruit, a little more uh, less, I guess, pressing, of course, is just wine style, matching the fruit with a good type of wine or good style of wine, and then just you know, issues with fruit growing and wine quality. So not just figuring out how to make the grapes survive, but how to grow the grapes in a way that they can actually produce better wine. So there's like two layers there that we're trying to you know, get to, the first layer and then the second layer. But what, is, what does even quality mean? And that's one of the you know, challenges in my position is that quality itself is kind of a vague term. And it varies a lot about individual and who you're talking to. So someone in the service industry might talk about complexity, body, weight, food and wine pairing. You know, the Sauv Blanc from New Zealand tastes like it should be a Sauv Blanc from New Zealand, or is the flavors profiles off? You know, integration and harmony and all these terms that they like to use for their wine quality. Uh, from a producer's perspective, you know, is it free from faults? Is it bottle stable? Did it, get, did it produce the type of wine that I was trying to make? And it might be what producers and, are looking for in terms of what they define quality. And you know, here's two drastically different types of wine. You know, Screaming Eagle being a $1,000 plus per bottle cult wine out of California and Behringer producing you know, an $8 bottle of white Zin. And then we talk about quality, which one is more quality? Which is a higher quality wine? Well, it depends on how you want to look at it. You might say the Screaming Eagle, because of its complexities and, what, and complexities, and where it's from is a high quality wine. But you know, I could easily say that Behringer is a high quality wine, because that wine, well, one I've done, you know, I did tons of analysis on that wine. So we can tell you that a lot of effort and research goes into that wine production. Very careful about it. A lot of effort goes into it. And when you go pick up a bottle of white Zin, white Zin from Behringer off the shelf, one bottle could be produced last month. The other bottle could have been bottled six months ago. They'll be identical, pretty much. That's a difficult feat to achieve. And that reproducibility that they have should not be understated. So it depends you know, on what you determine quality to be. When you start talking about you know, wine faults and things that are bad quality, it, it gets to be a bit of a fine line between what constitutes complexity and what's objectionable. So somebody might like a little bit of a character in their wine, someone else might think it's the worst thing ever. You know, where that line is drawn is really dependent upon you as an individual, you know, your experience with wine. How much wine have you drank? How many different regions have you drank it from in your history with that? As well as perspective. Uh, the example that I saw of perspective is, say, two individuals smell rosemary in a wine. You know, one person might associate that with a culinary, a ch you know, rosemary chicken, or some other food application. But another person might c compare that with a uh, personal care product like a lotion. So which would you rather have your wine smell like? <laughs> so two people smelling the same thing are going to have two very different ideas on whether they like that wine or not. And then you get into physiology, which is, is every one of us smells wine differently. What we're sensitive to and not sensitive to is very individual. So every person's experience is unique. It makes quality kind of a challenge to define. So I refer to Dr. Besson out of UC Davis who defined gray, which is generally recognized as yucky. So these are the compounds I focus on when it comes to Wisconsin wine. As we mentioned before, here's a few examples, more some of the common examples of issues you may find in wine and cider. So sulfides, oxidation and acetaldehyde. Cork taint, which is you know, a compound called trichloroanosol or TCA, if you want to sound hip at your next dinner party. Uh, Britannomyces, 4-ethylphenol, uh, 4-ethylguacol, and then acetic acid, ethyl acetate, VA, and a few other things we'll talk, we'll talk about. I don't know if that is very visible from back there, but sulfides are not a very pleasant compound. They're usually a result of stressed yeast and a fermentation. Start kicking out you know, uh, 
I can start out with rotten eggs all the way down to canned vegetables. So these are kind of some of the initial layers of uh, some wine flaws that you might come across, definitely probably not acceptable, except in very tiny amounts. Another area that's a problem is you, uh, just the oxygen, oxygen pressure on the wine during storage as well as stress fermentations. So if the wine is stored in an environment that has a lot of oxygen pressure on it, whether it's a, a low grade plastic tank where the oxygen can transmit through the side or a lot of headspace, the ethanol can be you know, converted over to acetaldehyde. And acetaldehyde uh, at low levels can give kind of a fruitier, comp you know, fruity aspect to your wine. Higher levels start to smell like rotten apples. Further than that, you know, I, I get more of an airplane glue, model airplane glue aroma. <laughs> Nuttiness, but generally considered a flaw, unless you're sherry where it's expected and needs to be in very high levels. So it's kind of, you know, wine flies are always a, kind of an interesting area depending on what you're trying to achieve. But this is a common sort of flaw that we find in Wisconsin just because of you know, proper application of meta, uh, sulfur dioxide as well as minimizing oxygen exposure, which as you get on smaller and smaller scales and more surface area, tends to be a much bigger challenge for small wineries to maintain. So TCA is a combination of mold and chlorine. So a little bit of mold plus any sort of chlorine in the environment, you know, most people think it's based from cork, but it could be from the winery itself. If there's any mold and they use a chlorinated cleaning component, you can get winery borne TCA as well. Not a very pleasant compound, super potent, it's a parts per trillion sensitivity. Like a low as five parts per trillion, people can start to pick up on this compound. It's like you know, one gram in its Olympic size swimming pool is what we can detect. So. Cork is, you know, you can see where you may get a little bit of, you know, mold or whatever from the cork. I mean, that's an agricultural product, too. So some unpleasant compounds uh, from Britannomyces. Britannomyces is a spoilage yeast. It's present in the environment, on the grapes. Uh, if a winemaker is not in a situation where they have a high pH wine, Britannomyces thrives well in high pH, higher pH environments. Low pH, they don't survive as well. Uh, sulfites are good at maintaining them, but they can produce, and if there's a lot of residual uh, nitrogen left, one of the things I didn't mention before was that a lot of these hybrids actually have a lot of nitrogen content. You need a certain amount of nitrogen content to maintain a healthy fermentation, but in a lot of cases, depending on where it's grown, I've seen uh, fruit out of Iowa have uh, yeast assimilable nitrogen content or a primary nitrogen content that the yeast use uh, at six to seven times what the yeast actually needs. So a lot of that gets left over in the final fermentation. And if you're not properly maintaining your wine, it can feed your know, spoilage organisms pretty well. And then you get some pretty awful things. Unless, of course, you like sour beer, and then those are the things you're looking for. So it depends on what you're into. You know, another concern here in Wisconsin, a lot of places as acetic acid and the conversion of acetic acid to uh, ethyl acetate, which smells like nail polish remover. Uh, acetic acid, you know, if you've got a lot of oxygen present on your wine and you're not properly sulfiding it, then the acetobacter can take over and start kicking it out. Otherwise, you know, stressed yeast, particularly ice wines, can get a bit of a VA naturally. It's kind of a natural process for that. Uh, this one, uh, mousiness is typically associated with cider. I kind of bring it up because it's an interesting particular compound because you can't smell it at, wine, at the cider pH. So until you taste it, you won't know it's there. So it's kind of a uh, horrible shock sort of reality. The you know, pH, if you, and it depends on the individual. So if you're an individual who has a higher pH saliva, it raises the pH of the the wine or the cider, and then it becomes nice and noticeable on the finish of your palate. It's not the greatest you know, way to finish a sip of wine, but uh, some other common things are your know, protein formation, or protein, you know, haze formation due to protein instability due to heating of the wine, you know, potassium bitartrate, or obviously little crystals you might get if you chill wine. 
Wineries still put a lot of effort to remove those from wine. Uh, apparently consumers still might mistake them for glass particles. It's a lot of effort to do that. A lot of energy goes into chilling wine down and getting the, the uh, potassium bitrate to settle out of it simply for cosmetic reasons. You do get a little bit of acid reduction from that, so wineries here like to do it. You kind of get a little bit, take down their uh, acidity a little bit. But again, you know, depending on who you are, sometimes hazes are good. You know, a couple of, uh, one new kind of recent, in the last five, 10 years, uh, popular wine is thing called orange wine. So it's white wine that's been fermented on its skins. Some of it's been fully filtered and processed out to look like a clear wine, but some of it's just left raw, hazy, and you know, kind of natural. So there's a whole group of people that get into that. And I talked about pet nat a little bit. So you get a wine that has sediment in it because of that re-fermentation of the yeast in the bottle. So the world is kind of changing in the world of wine of what's considered acceptable and unacceptable anymore. So you can see the, uh, the orange wine on top there is very cloudy. That's intentional. So in terms of Wisconsin wine and whether or not these gray issues are more common, it's hard to say. I mean, I've been to wine regions all over the country and the world, and I've experienced and encountered these problems everywhere. The typical issues, obviously, are experience in both just recognizing what, those, what these flaws are and how to prevent them in production uh, expertise, uh, one of the things, you know, recognizing that, you know, commercial wine production is a much different animal than home wine production, which can be a challenge for some people to make that transition and realizing there's a whole new world of technology that they have to learn how to deal with to get better at and producing a, uh, a commercial wine. Uh, a lot of people get into the winemaking world without having scientific background and wine production is a very scientific thing. So you'll get people who have approached retirement, decide they want to open a winery, probably haven't had a chemistry class since sophomore year of high school. It makes things a little challenging at times. And then it's a very capital intensive and expensive proposition to start a winery. So having proper equipment and laboratory equipment to do quality wine production can be a bit of a challenge. So the things we do here, well, we have analytical services, so we can do some of the higher end analysis for you. Uh, we do, I do site visits, I go out and I consult with wineries and help them work through their challenges. If they wish to contact me and work on those, we'll do that. Otherwise, I hold workshops and educational events where we address specific winemaking issues. And then we're working on some various cold climate specific research to improve the quality of the wine, to, do, to understand how we can make wine out of these varieties. So uh, horticulture is probably presented here, I'm pretty sure at least once or twice, but some of the things they're working on is the impact of fruit shading and sun exposure on the quality of fruit. So they're going out and pulling the leaves off and leaving other, some vines very well shaded, some vines very well exposed, and looking at kind of the differences of what the chemistry of those varieties are. We're also looking at trellising, different types of trellises, best ways to grow various varieties. One type of trellis system might not work well with one variety than another. Uh, looking, they're looking at some pest management as well as uh, disease management options as well. So on our side, over in analogy, it was a pretty easy thing to take the fruit shading thing and well, let's make some wine out of it and we can compare the flavor of that. We'll, it's hard to say whether one's better than the other based on your personal preferences, but at least we'll be able to sh give these examples of shading to winemakers and they can make decisions about the style of wine they want to choose based on the results that we can give them. Looking at the impact of skin contact and fermentation temperature, and then I will hopefully focus on the future uh, of wine research that I was doing at the University of Minnesota, which was biological acid management using yeast and bacteria to help manage acidity in wine and dealing with that high malic acid content we have here. I guess one of my ultimate goals is to identify the flavor compounds in cold climate grapes and understand how viticulture and enology influences those. So if a wine we can give winemakers a range of options on how to make their wine based on you know, what, how flavor is influenced. 
So some of the research we're doing right now uh, with a undergraduate group during their senior project is actually looking at uh, skin temperature and fermentation, skin contact and fermentation temperature during red wine production. You know, traditional red wine production, seven to 14 days of skin contact before they press it out. Warmer temperatures, you know, 75 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And the goal there is to extract as much tannins and phenolics and color and flavors from the grapes. Well, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that we don't have a lot of tannins and we have a lot of color. So it doesn't necessarily make, doesn't make sense for us to be using standard vinifera practices to be making wine. So these undergraduates, very ambitious group of undergraduates that we have in the department, are evaluating the uh, color, phenolic content, and flavor differences in two varieties of wine, Marquette and Frontenac, uh, and looking at you know, cool fermented and warm for, or ambient temperature fermentations at different skin contact times. They're still in process with that, so hopefully we'll have those results and we can bring it to winemakers you know, for their annual meeting this winter. It's going to be impossible to read, but there's an arrow pointing at the skin, and then there's a long list of things that we find in the skin. So that's where the skin contact research comes into play here. Is do, are all those compounds in the skins of hybrid varieties things we actually want in the wine? And is it better to do a shorter skin contact versus a longer skin contact fermentation? We know that from other research that exposing the fruit to more sun does lower acidity, gives it more sugar, and increases the phenolic content and gives it a different flavor profile. And the three varieties that we're looking at uh, for this, this year are Marquette, Frontenac, and Petit Pearl. You know, horticulture is examining the basic chemistry of these things throughout the growing season. And we're going to take them, we're fermenting them right now, and we're going to look at the flavor differences and see if there's a change in the kind of hybrid herbaceousness and vegetal character of some of these varieties, and whether or not you know, shading or unshading is actually a positive or negative attribute. So in terms of tannins, uh, Cornell University is doing a lot of research on tannins. You know, I say there's not a lot of tannins in the final wine, but there's actually a fair amount of tannins in the grapes themselves. So an active area of research is trying to figure out why there's no tannin in the final wine. You know, their hypothesis and research indicates that there's a grape solid, a grape particle, that during fermentation is binding with the tannins and causing those tannins to settle out of the fermentation. And then they've done research where they've added tannins at the start of the fermentation and measured how much tannins were afterwards. And it takes a tremendous amount of tannins to get any result. So these particles are very powerful and very active. So research that I've done quite a bit of you know, back at the University of Minnesota and will continue to do so moving forward here at the University of Wisconsin is looking at acid management. Because one of the things that we're having the most one of the biggest challenges we have are the high acidity of these grapes and grape varieties, particularly malic acid. And it's not just so much purely sourness that we got to worry about, but it's the interaction of acid with other compounds. So the more acid we have in there, the more likely you're going to taste some of the bitterness compounds that might be present. And the more likely you're going to have some astringency because malic acid itself has an astringent character. So in terms of what we have available to us to manage acidity, you know, there's really other, once it gets to the winery, there's only a couple, a few methods we can deal, use. So there's some chemical methods, and then there's using biology. So as far as you know, chemical deacidification, we have uh, potassium bicarbonate, calcium carbonate, or chalk. Otherwise, you can use water, try to just, you know, reduce the acidity that way or add a lower acid. Grape to it. In terms of biological deacidification, we have you know, the bacteria and yeast. So potassium bicarbonate, calcium carbonate are the two main ones. You know, the the you know, important factor to realize there is that most of those only work on tartaric acid. They won't reduce the malic acid content. So if you have a variety of lots of malic acid into it, it, we can't really reduce that acid very far. And it leaves a much higher level of malic acid a ratio there, which kind of gives it a more harshness to the wine. 
So when we're trying to use biological methods to reduce acidity. We're looking at yeast and bacteria that convert malic acid to some other byproduct. So bacteria convert malic acid to lactic acid, and then there's yeast that convert malic acid to ethanol. So, and we can do that. We, and there are yeast strains that have been identified that do that very well. Uh, there's uh, some non-traditional wine strains. So Saccharomyces is the traditional strain of yeast we use for wine production and beer production. But there's a, a strain of yeast called Schizosaccharomyces pombe, which is a, does a great amount of malic to ethanol fermentation. And then research here, potentially in the genetics department, might identify some yeast strains and produce some yeast strains that can do some biological acid management as well. So there's just certain strains out there that have been identified that do, a pretty, that do some level of acid reduction. Uh, 71B that I've used in the past can reduce acidity by you know, two grams per liter, which is a significant amount of acid reduction. So then there's malolactic fermentation used using malolactic bacteria. And besides acid reduction, winemakers use malolactic bacteria for you know, flavor and style, as well as microbial stability. That's just one less thing that an organism can utilize from a fermentation once it's gotten bottled. And there's a, a range of organisms out there capable of malolactic fermentation, lots of lactic acid bacteria. You know, the strain that we commercially use is Enococcus. So malolactic fermentation is not really actually a fermentation. It's kind of a misnomer. As, you know, most fermentations take sugar and then convert it to an acid. So it actually increases the acidity of what you're trying to do. So malolactic fermentation is actually reducing the acidity. And it does that using an enzyme that converts the malic acid to lactic acid. There's some other byproducts or other Comp compounds there, it can also begin to chew on and use to pro uh, produce other compounds. Uh, it can break citric acid, citric acid down into diacetyl and, and pyruvate and acetic acid. You know, I bring up uh, diacetyl because it's a compound that the, the, that's produced and it masks fruity aroma in wine. So we look at using bacteria to manage acidity in wine, this is a byproduct that's a negative aspect. So how do we manage your diacetyl production in malolactic fermentation so that it doesn't decrease the fruitiness of wine, especially if you're going to use it on a rosé or a, a white wine where you want to enhance fruitiness as much as possible. So a couple of couple formulas, you know, always feels good to throw some of those on there, but basically we're converting malic acid to lactic acid just by using the enzyme to cleave off one of the carbonyl groups on the malic acid. And some of the research that I look into then is the timing of malolactic bacteria additions. One of the reasons why we look into that is that we know that yeast can convert diacetyl to another compound that's not nearly as strong smelling. It doesn't have a, it's nice a name as diacetyl, but you know, two, three butane diol, but it, it's, it's helpful to know that you know, if the yeast is present, we can t you know, alter the timing of malolactic fermentation such that we can remove that diacetyl and be able to apply it to fruity uh, wines where we don't want the diacetyl to mass character. The challenge, though, is that a lot of people around here make sweet wines. And then to prevent further fermentation, they'll use a compound called potassium sorbate. It, it um, <clears throat> inhibits f further uh, yeast activity in the wine. The only problem is, is that if, and they're using that typically because they don't feel confident enough in their sterile filtration to prevent further fermentation once the wine is in the bottle. Consequently, if there is a, a bacterial infection or a bacterial presence, with wines that have potassium sorbate, then there's a geranium taint issue that can result. So they convert that sorbic acid into a compound that smells a lot like geranium leaves. So when I was at the University of Minnesota, my, under, my graduate research project was looking at malolactic bacteria additions and timing on Marquette wine production. And one of the things I found was that uh, it did reduce the 
uh, reduce the time of malolactic fermentation completion. That's another advantage of a co-inoculation strategy, which is adding bacteria within 24 hours after of adding your yeast, versus the traditional method, which is to add bacteria after alcoholic fermentation is completed. Uh, the impact, uh, no impact on the liking of the wine, and it reduced malolactic fermentation overall time. So knowing that there's all these advantages to using bacteria, you know, looking at how we can apply that to white and sweet wine production uh, would be great for the Wisconsin wine industry. Uh, the other biological method that's out there uh, is the Schizosaccharomyces pombe, which uh, is a commercial product under Promalic. It's naturally considered a spoilage organism, so what this company did was encapsulate it in an alginate shell. So we could put them into these mesh bags, add them to the wine, starts doing the malo to ethanol fermentation, and then once we're complete or reached a desired level of acid reduction, we can pull it out and hopefully take all that yeast with, it, with us so that it doesn't result in some of the negative sensory aspects that people believe it can produce. I would like to research that a bit further and actually look at other strains and see if there's a way to actually use it in its natural form without the alginate shell to see if we can to produce wines that have low acid content. I've used the, uh, the Promalic in the past and have had some success with it. So wine, I've taken you know, Lercrescent that had a TA titrable acidity probably in the 12 to 14 range and had a final product at about six and a half grams per liter. So it does work and it can work quite well. But it's just a matter of what are the fermentation conditions that we can you know, succeed with that as well as minim minimizing all flavors, you know, trying to tailor that to specific wine styles. At one point, there was a, a group of researchers out of British Columbia who actually took both uh, the aspects of Enococcus and S. Pombe and created a genetically modified yeast called ML01. It was on the market for a while. It got pr approved by the Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau. And I believe it's still potentially out there. Uh, this was originally sold under the Red Star brand, which eventually got bought out by a French company called Anardis. French aren't very happy about uh, genetically modified creatures, so this kind of disappeared from the market after that merger. But it is something that was out there and was approved by the TTB. One of the things that we hopefully can develop here is that uh, the Hindinger lab upstairs has found ways to create some novel yeast strains under a new technology. So right now it's being applied mainly to beer production, but could some of these yeasts actually enhance and produce interesting wines and ciders? So hopefully we'll be able to start researching that in the future as well. So uh, embracing the cold climate wine production, you know, looking at and identifying processing techniques that influence flavor, managing acidity, coming up with some new yeast strains. And I like to say, you know, there's a lot of room for experimentation and creativity in this industry. Uh, Canada, for example, some researchers up there are looking at uh, grape drying, you know, the Amarone raisin style wine production. But instead of just taking grapes and putting them into uh, the attic of a barn and blowing air through them, they've looked at a wide range of doing, ways of doing that, including using, you know, retired tobacco dryers to rapidly dry down grapes and create different types of wines and take advantage of the properties that those grapes have available to them. So there's you know, opportunities out there and there's no restrictions, you know, it's not Europe where you have to grow your grapes a certain way, produce your wine a certain way. There's all sorts of options and opportunities. So if you're, you know, I guess, an adventurous sort, Growing grapes and wine and making wine here in Wisconsin is kind of a great place to be. And with that, I thank you all for coming. There's my contact information if you have any other questions about making wine in Wisconsin. Thank you for having me.